In the gospel lesson for this, the second Sunday after Pentecost, Christ Jesus calls the tax collector Matthew, who immediately follows him, and then he goes on to make two miraculous healings. But I want to focus more on what St. Matthew recounts uh, regarding Christ Jesus and his disciples sitting with and eating with tax collectors and sinners. Now this would certainly horrify any first century Jewish person, not to mention the Pharisees. Their disdain and judgment would be heard in their question, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But to be fair, hindsight is 2020, and we have 2,000 years or more of considering the Pharisees to be the villains, as it were. But in the first century, the Pharisees were not necessarily thought of as the bad guys, at least not as far as many of their Jewish followers were concerned. After all, the Pharisees were those that were tireless in in watching, hiding behind shrubbery if need be, to make sure that the Jewish people were following all of the 613 laws and rules that the Pharisees had determined were actually in the law as given to Moses. So eating with anyone who broke any of the commandments especially a traitor to the Jewish people that was in cahoots with the Roman usurpers over them, the collaborators, like tax collectors, they would stand condemned, completely condemned, and hence that statement. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? That means he and you are condemned. Now Christ Jesus hears this question and he speaks God's truth to the Pharisees. Those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, as per usual, Christ Jesus packs plenty into an economy of words. So what is he saying to the Pharisees and indeed all that will hear his voice? Well, Christ Jesus is actually restating the word of the Lord. These are not new words to him. It's actually he's quoting God himself as it were. And these words were spoken to the Israelites, especially to the religious leaders. From the sixth chapter of the book of the prophet Hosea. What shall I do to you, O Ephraim, which means Israel? What shall I do to you, O Judah? Your mercy is as a morning cloud, as the early dew that goes away. Therefore I have cut off your prophets I have slain them with the words of my mouth, and my judgment shall go forth as the light. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they are as a person who transgresses the covenant, they, and they have despised me. Gilead is a city of evildoers. Your strength is that of a pirate. The priests have hidden the way. They have murdered the people of Shechem, for they have done lawlessness. God's word now stands before the Pharisees in person, and they know exactly what he is saying. Sadly, Israel, along with their leaders, have betrayed the covenant with God the covenant that God made with them. And they have done that specifically in a specific fashion by their distorting their understanding of God and distorting their worship of God. 
So that's what we need to look at here as the church, especially in these last days. So some people think, maybe many people think, that the central message in the Old Testament is obedience to the law, which brings reconciliation to God. But that's not the fullness of the truth. There's much more there. And the church must be very careful because reading and interpreting the Old Testament in this way is reading and interpreting the Old Testament as the Pharisees would. Their understanding of the law given to Moses, which is the giving of the law, is the reality that God is calling his people to live in. It's not first and foremost a rule book. That God desires for all humanity to live as the Ten Commandments have put forth. But what happens is, is there's courtroom drama that begins to pop up in the Israelites. There's more than the Ten Commandments there. There's actually 613 little laws here and there that we can kind of bring out. And not only will we bring out all those 613 laws, we'll have a look at them, we'll discuss them, we'll interpret them, we'll reinterpret them, we'll codify them, and then we'll take them and lay them on the backs of the people. So what the religious leaders had actually ushered in, instead of focusing on God first, loving God and loving neighbor, and worshiping God in spirit and in truth, they've ushered in a legal loophole system, kind of a, a quagmire of religious justice, in order that they and their followers could actually judge other people. Thank God I'm not like that one. And exactly that is what they were thinking and saying when they saw Jesus. Thank God I'm not like them. So they distorted and deflected the central reality of life that God was calling the people to. That's to seek God first. And by faithfully and humbly worshiping God in spirit and in truth, do so out of love for God and love for neighbor. Oftentimes people say, I don't like to come to church. There's other things I can do and I can worship on the golf course or whatever. The reality is, is you're here for the other. Maybe you don't need other people, but maybe people need you. They need the gifts that you have, the compassion that you have, the wisdom that you have. The church exists for the good of others. But instead, the leaders helped the people, sadly, to focus first on strict observances, duties, traditions, and practices, meaning that they had removed the spirit of the law meaning they had removed God from the reality that the law brings. That's the reality that God calls humans to live in. And that loving relationship with God then leads to people following the devices and desires of their own hearts, not God's desire for the reality that God wishes humanity to participate in, and that the law reveals. So the church must be careful in these last days to understand that the heart of God's covenants, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Old Covenant or the New Testament, is the same. The heart of God is the same. The two covenants are actually the same reality. God's desired reality for creation. The Old Covenant's purpose is to point towards the New Covenant in Christ, which he reveals fully. 
Christ Jesus reveals fully the reality. This is what it looks like to be as God in the world, like God in the world. The reality that God calls human beings to is to live with him, to participate in God's life with him, not to follow a rule book, but to willingly receive the love letter that has been written by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And both covenants call all human beings to union with God through true faith and true action, through humble, selfless love. That's why Christ our God quotes himself, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge, meaning union with the life of God, more than burnt offerings. So knowing God, meaning being at one with God, living life who is God, means humble, faithful, truthful action, cooperation with the Holy Spirit, and selfless love for God and for neighbor. Now we need to be mindful here because some people get a crooked idea here. God speaking through the prophet Hosea and God with us rebuking the Pharisees as he eats with tax collectors and sinners doesn't mean that those details about sacrifices and burnt offerings in the Old Testament and the details of the liturgical worship in the New Testament are all but pointless. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying just love people, be merciful to them, nothing else really matters, go and do whatever you want as far as worship goes. No, that's not what he's saying. Because then we would have to skip over the scriptures. Perhaps the greatest ode to the power and the depth and the reality of God's mercy in all of scripture, which is Psalm 51. The repentant King David opens his soul of love for God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your great steadfast love and mercy. For if you had desired sacrifice, I would have given it, but you delight not in whole burnt offerings. What does this mean? There's no point in liturgical worship. There's no point in holy tradition of receiving that which is handed down from Christ through the apostles. Just love God in your heart and everything's fine. Kind of do whatever you want and it's all, it's all good. Is that right? No. Because then we'd have to leave off the last of the psalm, which reads, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Then you will be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness. Is that not what the church does when gathering together for the Eucharistic liturgy? Think of that, ponder that, take hold of that. The Eucharistic liturgy is our thanks and praise to God. Righteous, why? Because when we come together, we gather together, we repent. Do we not? Yeah. And what that does is that opens our souls to the righteousness of God that dwells within by way of the Holy Spirit. Because of our love for God and our neighbor, we lay aside our earthly cares, repenting of our sins before our loving God who makes this sacrifice of thanks and praise possible, makes the sacrifice of thanks and praise meaningful 
and powerful. So Christ Jesus' point that he is making to the Pharisees, and they knew it, and they hated him for it. His point is this. The proper worship of God happens within the reality of the human soul. In the person that is broken, the person that is merciful, the person that is repentant, the person that is loving. The human soul lays aside the cares and calls of worldliness upon her or him. And when the soul has done that work of repentance, of humbling oneself, of giving one's power over to God, to worship God in spirit and in truth in a place like this, then the soul has done the work and the worship of God in love, in righteousness, yields the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God, as we know, is at one with God. God's life becomes the life that we live, which is eternal life. But the Pharisees, well, they already claim to be righteous. They claim to be righteous according to their own law. That's what I would be doing if I was out playing golf instead of being here and it wasn't my vacation. Jesus leaves them then to their own delusion because the truth of God was then and remains to this day that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As one saint wrote, the church must repent of giving in to the urge to set things like mercy and love in opposition to the traditions and teachings of the church regarding worship and spiritual discipline. And boy, is that rampant these days. For it is possible to engage in the outward forms of worship and spiritual disciplines and yet be devoid of their inner content. And that is precisely the sin of the Pharisees and also of the whole nation of Israel whom Hosea laments with the words of the Lord. It is why Hosea says that the priests have hidden the way. For anyone can heap money on the poor without actually loving them. Priests and people can claim worship is outdated and needs change. However, when we look at the whole of the scripture and the holy tradition of the church, we see many elements which if emphasize singularly, don't like this and don't like that, could force the whole to fly apart into pieces. But those who insult the traditions of worship and spiritual discipline would do well to remember this, that the worship of the Old Testament was and is given word for word by God. Look in Leviticus. And they would do well to remember that Jesus told his listeners to obey the Pharisees, but not to imitate their example. What does that mean? That means that in these last days, the issue is not the worship. The issue is not the liturgy. And I may take some hits because of saying that, but so be it. The issue is not the worship as given by God to the church, beginning in the Old Testament and carried on in the New Testament by Christ and to the apostles who added the Holy Eucharist. We've simply taken the Old Testament worship and added the Holy Eucharist to it. It's one can, that was given by God. We didn't just think up the liturgy, nor are we free to go and change the liturgy whenever we feel like it. We can't say that the liturgy is outdated, that it's lacking in emotional highs, that it needs changing to be relevant. <clears throat> 
The issue is to focus on the condition of the human soul before God. As Christ says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Holy Spirit empowered followers of Christ understand this, and they continue in the liturgy given by God to the Israelites with the Eucharist added as Christ commanded. The liturgy is not in need of tweaking to be acceptable, nor is the liturgy an evangelistic tool. The liturgy is given by God. The liturgy is a call by God for each to conform in humility, in love, in mercy, and thanksgiving, rather than his or her own desires, will, and even imagination. That's why the liturgy is put in place by God, to keep that from happening. You want praise him? The heck with you. You don't want praise him? The heck with you. You want a five minute sermon? The heck with you. You want a 30 minute sermon? Forget it. What's that about? That's human centered worship. That's about what I want, not what God has graciously given us. The liturgy is given by God and a call by God for us to humble ourselves, to get out of bed, to come and worship because God is worth that. Our neighbor is worth that. The Holy Spirit of the living God resides within the baptized faithful soul. God within us, God with us. We take that far too lightly. God is not out there somewhere. God is within. The kingdom of God is within, Jesus says. And that means to truly live. That means to truly worship in spirit and in truth. The human soul is in need of repentance. To turn away from all that keeps us from God. From loving God and loving neighbor to refocus, to refocus on God first and others first. By way of what God has already given to the church to keep us from driving one another nuts. Do I love doing the liturgy all the time? No, I'd rather step out and say, let's do all kinds of wonderful things. But I have seen the folly of that because I'm a fallen human. And I don't want you folks following me and my ways. I want you seeking the face of God. Which means that we bring our own brokenness, our own weakness, our own self-righteousness, our own desire for how we ought to worship, what that ought to look like and sound like. And we humble ourselves before God and we open up our souls, we open up ourselves to be open to the righteousness of God that already dwells within. But it's we who grieve the Holy Spirit and say, no thanks. God never leaves, but God never forces us to be taking hold of and living his righteousness that is within but to open oneself up by repentance to the righteousness of God dwelling within, then worship in spirit and truth is already happening, already reality. Our sacrifice of thanks and praise is already acceptable in God's sight, just like Psalm 51. Christ Jesus reminds us again this morning, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, let those with ears hear. Amen. <laughs>